Our call to worship today is a poem by Ariana Brown, who is a queer, black, Mexican-American poet from the south side of San Antonio, Texas. Ariana's work investigates queer black personhood in Mexican-American spaces, black history and girlhood, loneliness, and care. This is her poem, For Everyone Who Tried on the Slipper Before Cinderella. <laughs> For those making tea, in the soft light of Saturday morning, in the peaceful kitchen, in the cool house. For those with shrunken hearts, still trying to love. For those with large hearts, trying to forget. For those with terrors they cannot name, upset stomachs and too tight pants. For those who get cut off in traffic. For those who spend all day making an elaborate meal that turns out mediocre. For those who could not leave, even when they had to. For those who will never win the lottery or become famous. For those getting groceries on Friday night. There is something you know about living that you guard with your life, your one fragile, wonderful life. Wonder as in awe, as in, I had no idea I would be here now. For those making plans and those who don't, for those driving across the country to a highway that knows them, for routes we take in the dark, trusting the roads, for the woods, for the dead humming in prayer, for an old record and a strong sun, for teeth bared to the wind, a pulse in the chest, a body making love to itself. There's every reason to hate it here. And there is a list of things making it bearable. Your friend's shoulder, Texas barbecue, a new book, a loud song, a strong song, a highway that knows you, sweet tea, an orange cat, a helping hand, an unforgettable dinner, a laugh that escapes you and deflates you like a pink balloon left soft with room for goodness to take hold. For those who have looked in the mirror and begged, for those with weak knees and an attitude, for those called sensitive or too much, for those not called enough, for the time you needed and went without, for the photo of you as a child quietly icing cupcakes, your hair a crackling thunderstorm. Love is coming. It's on its way. Look. Please join us in a moment of silent contemplation as we prepare for our time together. Love is coming. It's on its way. Look. These words and the sublime images that the poet evokes invites us to see awe and wonder all around us in the ups and downs of life. This church says in our vision statement that we are here, among other things, for seeking wonder. The six sources of Unitarian Universalism name in the first source the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. And that's what today is about. Mystery, wonder, 
openness. Direct personal experience tells us so much that we cannot learn any other way. Or, to put it in other words, our lives are sacred texts. So I welcome you to come on this journey, knowing that your personal experiences are different from mine and probably different from the people sitting next to you too. And that means that we're going to have different understandings of this great mystery called life. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tom. I'm your service leader today. We welcome you, old friends and new, young and old, online and in person, no matter how familiar or unfamiliar you are with us or us with you, your presence is in strengthening. We are one people of many philosophies, many origins, sexualities and genders. We are all growing, learning and loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. Please silence your cell phones and observe the perfume free zone over there. We have activity bags by the welcome table for any of our younger friends who might need something to do during the service. Just make sure to leave them back at the welcome table when you leave. We have nursery for ages kindergarten and under and you can bring your kids down to the nursery after the time for all ages story or any time. Masks are optional but supported here our services are recorded and are on YouTube, so please stay home if you're unwell. Kids, youth, parents, and the young at heart are invited to meet Reverend Tiffany in front of the candles table for a time for all ages story. We're managing the camera angles for your privacy, so please don't worry about being filmed and come on down. Good morning. It is so good to see you all today. Today's story has a part for everyone here. Everyone on this side of the building, there's going to come a part in the story where I need you all to shout out blue hat. And um, Gerald will cue you. You will know. You will know when it's time to do that. So don't try to guess. Just follow Gerald. Everyone over here, your job is going to be to say red hat. And you don't have to guess when you need to do that either. Sarah Sanders is going to cue you when it's time to say red hat. All of you here in the <coughs> middle have the most important job. You're going to answer a question for me when the time comes and it will be really clear when that's supposed to be because I'll lean over and ask you all. So, once upon a time, there was a village with a road that went straight down the center of town. And one day, something strange happened. God walked down that road and she was awesome. She wore a long black flowing robe had a very curly hair, and on top of her head was a hat. All the people stopped to stare at God as she walked by, and they kept staring until she disappeared into the distance. Boy, God sure was magnificent. What a beautiful blue hat she was wearing. Yes, God was amazing, but it wasn't a blue hat she was wearing. It was a red hat. You are so wrong. It was definitely a blue hat. It no. was clearly a blue hat, wasn't it? No way. You are the one that is wrong. It was clearly a red hat. You see the red, don't you? Red hat. As the two are 
argued, others joined in the dispute. Soon the whole village was arguing. All the people on one side of the road were certain that God was wearing a blue hat, and all the people on the other side of the road were certain that God was wearing a red hat. People got mad. They started yelling at each other. Help me out, everyone. Blue hat! We can't just let them spread these lies. It was a red hat. Blue hat! <laughs> red hat! Blue hat! Red hat! Blue hat! Red hat! Red hat! Finally, the people got so angry that they decided to build a wall straight down the center of town. From that point on, the people on one side of the wall were enemies with the people who lived on the other side of the wall. They never spoke to each other. On one side of the wall, the people built a church where they worshipped the God who wore a blue hat. And on the other side of the road, the people built a church where they worshipped the God who wore the red hat. And many, many years passed, and the people were still enemies. And then one day, God came walking back through the village. She was smiling and balancing on top of the wall that they had built. And all the people, when they saw her, ran out to the wall and cried out to her. You must settle our argument. Yes, the people on that side of the street say that when you walked through the village many years ago, you were wearing a blue hat. But we know better. We know you were wearing a red hat. So tell us, God, what color was your hat? Well, my, 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 isn't this interesting? It seems to me that these children sitting right here standing on the wall might have some thoughts about the color of my hat. What do you all say the color of my hat is? It's blue and red. And after hearing the children's replies, God said, that's right. My hat is red on one side and blue on the other. And then she walked out without another word. <laughs> it was very quiet for a moment. Suddenly, there was the sound of one child laughing. And then another child started laughing. And soon, the whole village was roaring with laughter. Everyone was laughing. <clears throat> because they had realized how foolish they had been. At the sound of the laughter that grew louder and louder, the wall began to shake and crumble until finally it came tumbling down to the ground. And for many, many years after that day, the people told the story of God's hat and how laughter had torn down the wall between a divided people. The end. Would any of you all like to tell me what that story is about? People can see the same thing and yet disagree on it. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? For me, this is called perspective or point of view. That people can form very different opinions based on their personal experiences. During today's service, I want you all here to be thinking about how your point of view, perhaps which side of the town that you're standing on, can influence what you believe. And then, after the service, if you tell Justin about it, he'll let you get something out of the prize basket. Thank you so much for helping me with this story, all of you. And you all may return to your seats. Special music is actually...
actually a somewhat obscure hymn from our hymnal. And by obscure, I mean that we really couldn't even find a recording of it online. Sophie and James have been working on it and want to share this beautiful tune and these amazing lyrics with you all. If you want to follow along, it is hymn number 319 in the hymnal, but it's probably not something you're going to recognize. If you want to just listen, you may want to close your eyes and let the beauty of this great cosmos sink into your imagination because love is coming. It's on its way. Look. Ye hath born children of a star amid the depths of space. The cosmic wonder from afar Within your mind's embrace Look out with all upon the heart Of countless living things The counterpoint of part with part As nature's chorus This table where we come to light candles of joy and sorrow is a table for all of us. If you'd like to share joy or concern in person, please use these candle cards which are located on that back table. And if you'd like to share a joy or a concern from a distance, please email me at minister at hvuuc.org. Please remember the family of Colby Griffith who was the nephew of Doug and Kim Chaffin. He passed away suddenly last week after a battle with diabetes. As a congregation, we've got a pretty big candle today and it comes with a story. At the end of this last December, hanging out with my family in a post-Christmas haze, I got a call from our then president asking about how to get an emergency announcement out to the congregation. A pipe had busted in our kitchen. The ceiling was destroyed. Appliances were filled with water. Boxes of pancake mix and insulation created a goopy mess in the inches of water that flowed from the hallway all the way back around to the far reaches of our fellowship hall, the Fred Ballroom. That first day, a number of us gathered with shop vacs, mops, and garbage bags as we tried to sort out what it would mean for our community. Pancakes and Jam, a congregational tradition where we trade pulpit and hymns for pancakes and an open mic on the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, had to be canceled. Since then, I have learned where the water shutoff valves are in the church, and our board learned a lot about insurance and contractors. We've had work days, we've had aesthetic teams meetings, and tile cleaning parties, and so much paperwork. And watching it all happen showed me how much you all love this church. Here, now, half a year later, we have a beautiful kitchen with new appliances, countertops, paint, and flooring. Today, we celebrate the grand opening of our kitchen with joy. If 
you have had any part in our kitchen's transformation, large or small, from cleaning off decorative tiles, to choosing paint, to hanging drywall, to lending a shop vac on that very first day. Will you please stand up? Thank you. Thank you so much to every one of you. This joy is an invitation to be grateful for the gift that we've received, to appreciate the meals and the coffee that we are going to share together here. And with that gift comes a responsibility to do our dishes, to clean up after ourselves, to learn how to make coffee, Y'all, this is truly our kitchen, and I am so happy that it's back better than ever. We hope you'll stay after the service today where we will continue the celebration of the best worst thing that has happened to us in this recent year. If you wish to light your own candle, we invite you to approach the side of the table that is closest to you and the candle keeper that is closest to you will assist you. We ask that you please light your candles at the back of the table first so that no one has to reach over and open flame. And if you wish for us to light a candle for you, please raise your hand until I acknowledge you and I will light a candle for you. Our community is so much larger than just those of us who are in the building this morning. And so we light a large candle to hold space for those who are not physically present with us, but are ever in our hearts. And we light a final candle for all which remains unspoken in our hearts and minds.
This from poet and disability activist Laura Hershey. <clears throat> what you risk telling your story. You will bore them. Your voice will break. Your ink will spill and stain your coat. No one will understand. Their eyes become fences. You will park yourself forever on the outside. Your differentness, once and for all, revealed and dangerous. The names you give to yourself will, will become epithets. Your happiness will be called bravery or denial. Your sadness will justify their pity. Your fear will magnify their fears. Everything you say will prove something about their God or their economic system. Your feelings that change day to day kaleidoscopic will freeze in place, brand you forever, and justify anything they decide to do with you. Those with power can afford to tell their story or not. Those without power risk everything to tell their story and must. Someone, somewhere, will hear your story and decide to fight, to live and refuse compromise. Someone else will tell their own story, risking everything. So good to be back with you all today after several weeks out of the pulpit. My time away was not exactly a vacation, but it was renewing in many ways. Along with several of our lay leaders here, I attended General Assembly, the annual gathering of Unitarian Universalists where we network, learn together, experience transformative services together, and vote on the matters that affect this movement. This year, we voted to continue to look at revising Article 2 of our bylaws, which includes our principles, which you can find on the front of your bulletin, and the sources, which you can find on the back of your bulletin today. Those of us who have been Unitarian Universalist for a while know the seven principles pretty well. When I snuck into the Soapbox Sunday service last week, I heard many of our presenters reference our principles. They are useful touchstones for us when we are trying to express our identity and our ethics. Our sources are less well known, but for me they are excellent reference points as I seek to understand myself, the world around me, and the big questions of life. So through this year, I will be taking a look at our sources. Not every week, they're going to be scattered throughout the year, and it's good to start at the beginning, which is definitely one of my favorite sources. It is direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life personal experience. It is really an authentic and genuine place to start in a quest for truth and meaning because the best place to start is where we're at. It's hard to imagine starting anywhere else. Whether we acknowledge it or not, our experiences are the lens through which we see our world from the earliest of ages. Early learning is often applying personal experiences to future decision making. We experience hunger, we cry, and someone shows up to feed us. This repeated direct personal experience teaches us that we can ask for help. In fact, that we can't survive any other way. On the other hand, some of us can be told not to touch the hot stove, mm -hmm. but more of us have to touch it at least once before we can believe that the stove is hot. 
Our source here talks about the direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder. And that does conjure visions of whatever we consider to be sacred. Hikes to waterfalls, the birth of a child, the passing of a loved one surrounded by family after a good life, music that just makes you want to dance, a community of people gathered around one another in support. Transcending mystery and wonder can look like all of those things and so much more. And the power of personal experience goes beyond the things that make us feel good. Getting cut off in traffic can be a spiritual experience too. It really can be, maybe not one that you're enjoying. Um, you realize that everything that makes us human is another tile in the mosaic of who we are and that being human isn't always sunshine and rainbows. For some of us, personal experience has even led us to leaving a church. This can also be transcending mystery and wonder that renews our spirit. It is, after all, a big decision, making personal sacrifices for the authenticity and the freedom that we need. A friend of mine tells the story of how years ago he was in an absolutely horrible family situation and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed about it, asking God to rescue him because nothing else had worked and because that's what his preacher had said he should do. And then, like a light bulb that came on in the middle of one more desperate prayer, he realized that he was going to have to save himself. And he did. He talks about it a lot like people talk about getting saved, except it was about his experience of God's absence rather than his experience of God's presence. This mystery is a big mystery here, and our personal experiences will vary. Direct personal experience teaches us to trust our own eyes when the emperor has no clothes. That if some old guy walking down the street naked is just naked, not the height of fashion that we peasants just can't understand. Direct experience, the wisdom of our senses, is an antidote to the dogma which manipulates you into buying invisible fabric and cheering at the nude fashion parade. Can you think of a time that your personal experiences gave you the freedom to reject something that someone was trying to sell you? An experience that you saw with your own eyes or felt with your own hands that offered you a truth counter to the stories that someone else was trying to tell you? It's easy to see what an excellent source of truth and meaning our personal experiences can be. If you've had a story about your life that's meaningful to you, that's helped shape who you are and your worldview, that's given you some source of comfort or wisdom or insight, then you have engaged with this first source already. And... Like all of our sources and resources, it has its limitations as well. Can you think about what limitations are encountered if we lean too heavily on direct personal experience alone? If you're feeling bold and want to shout out a brief answer, I'd love to hear it. What are the limitations of this source? Your culture, okay the limitations of your personal experience and perspective. I think our Time for All Ages story really says what I want to say about the limitations of personal experience. Whether we see God as a red hat or a blue hat, curly haired, completely bald, or wishful thinking, we might be only seeing part of the picture. Like John Godfrey Sachs's poem about the six blind men encountering the elephant, one says the elephant is like a wall, one says the elephant is like a snake, and so on. And they're all right. And 
they're all wrong because the elephant is more than any one of them can experience at any time. It is together that they can hold a broader perspective. We encounter the limitations of direct personal experience when we encounter people and experiences which are drastically different from our own, people who come from drastically different cultures of our own. I remember how shocked one of my male colleagues was when he actually witnessed the sexual harassment that my female colleagues and I had told him was commonplace. He had been hearing about it forever, but there was a different level of belief and a different level of commitment to changing things once he had witnessed it himself. And yet, it had been happening all along. This limitation was true for him, and it's often been true for me, that we unintentionally carry the mindset that if something's not happening to me, then it's not happening. Part of my coming of age as a young woman was waking up to the very real experiences of racism that people of color have experienced, but that I had never experienced myself. And being raised fairly well off meant that I was also, it was also easy for me to believe that poor people were poor because of their own bad choices until I worked side by side with them. Now, 25 years later, I just believe someone when they tell me their personal experience, even when they are dramatically different from my own often because I am protected by the color of my skin, the conventional nature of my gender expression and relationship status, the relatively typical way that my brain functions, and the sheer amount of economic privilege that I hold. This calling to broaden our, and, and this calling to broaden our perspective goes beyond people's stories too. A lot of us know that our planet is going through a human-inflicted rough spot, but a summer of toxic air quality shows us the power of personal experience in understanding the situation at a much deeper level. The planet has been telling us in its own way that things are bad, and now it's screaming, and maybe more people will listen. Because even though personal experience contains the limitations of our own individual perspectives, it brings us the emotional impact, the sheer motivation and willpower that few other things will do, which is why this source is so important to me. Sometimes it's not enough to know something intellectually. Sometimes we need to experience something and really let it get into our souls, whether it's the horrors of Canadian forest fires or the pure joy of experiencing, accepting, and transformative community, like the accepting and transformative community that I witnessed right here last week. I think the key to this source, then, is in recognizing that personal experience has a very collective element to it. It's not my life as a sacred text. It's our lives, our sacred texts, together. Mary Oliver didn't say everything she needed to say in just one poem, and the universe's story is not told in just one life, but many. So we listen to each other. We believe each other, and we are present with each other's lives so that they can transform us too. And maybe, just maybe, we don't have to touch the hot stove before it burns us. The opportunity to hear each other's stories and find the thread of what is sacred with their lived experiences can transform us in the hearing, just as our own stories can transform us in the telling. And that brings us back full circle to the reading Tom shared with us before my sermon. When we tell our stories, 
there is a risk involved. Being believed and being disbelieved can be equally scary. You have a million experiences, a million stories, a million sacred texts within you. Do you have a story you need to tell today? Or is there a story somewhere in this community, in this room, that you need to hear? Think about a personal experience that you've had that has taught you something. Maybe it was awesome. Maybe it was awful. Either way, there was awe involved. Think about it. Think about a personal experience you've had that's been a sacred text to you. I invite you to turn to your neighbor and share a story. A story that is part of the sacred text of your own life. If you're watching at home, you might want to journal about this for a moment, and you might even want to email it to me at minister at hvuuc.org. We will do this for about five minutes before the bell calls us back together. Tell a story, any story. Do not live too far in the past or the future. Live now. In each moment, expect a miracle. Ten kinds of birds at the feeder or in the tracks of a fox in the snow. Pick up a magnifying glass and scrutinize that crocus. See the pollen at the center of the daffodil. Life's dust, death-defying life. Be astonished at the flower, arrested by its beauty. Run naked through the garden early in the morning. Perhaps earlier is better. <laughs> and, and hope the wild geese fly by. Get silly and laugh loudly with your grandchildren or your grandparents. Refuse to leave the dead behind. I think I need some help with this. Refuse to leave the dead behind, but bring their memory to all your chores and games and corners of quiet, warm tears. Know always that joy and sorrow are woven together one cannot be without the other. If you love, know that sometimes your love will bring you tears. And if you grieve, know that it's because at some time you were willing to love. Do not be afraid to die today, but expect life. Thank you. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. If you're, visiting, if you're visiting, we invite you to leave your information at the welcoming table and to uh, grab a brochure. The Religious Education Collaborative is seeking passionate volunteers to serve as teachers for religious education this fall. We are hoping to expand our kids and youth classes from two to four, if we have enough volunteer support to do so. Please see Justin Ridley, I think he's here, back there or email him at dre at hbuuc.org if you are interested or for more information. RE teacher training will be held Saturday, August 12th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. at the church. The Social Justice Peace Works Focus Group is inviting us, all of us, to join them at the Peace Pentagon in Independence, Virginia, this Saturday, July 15th, for a day of peace-oriented ceremony and learning opportunities. Please see Noel. She's here somewhere, too. Uh, email peace at hbuc.org or visit our website for more information or to sign up. And join us next Sunday after church for a so social justice call to action meeting about gun safety. Also, please join us for the kitchen celebration after church today. That's Tom's. Okay. Thank you so much 
for being here with us today. I hope you'll join us next Sunday where we can see exactly how off the wall our sources and inspirations can be when we use the wisdom of the Muppets to consider the complexities of building community together. If you have any Muppet related gear, bring it. If you have a Mupp favorite Muppet, think about it. And keep an eye out uh, online for a chance to vote for your favorite Muppet sometime this week. <laughs> Y'all, this is going to be a great one to bring your kids to. Speaking of kids, any kids and youth who want to meet Justin up here to tell him what you learned today can get something from the prize basket. And I'd like to make you aware of a workshop that I'm offering on Saturday, August 12th. It's called Listening and Caring Skills, and it's an opportunity for anyone who would like to attend to deepen their ability to listen to others and how to invite them to share their stories. Whether you want to listen to our friends and members who are homebound or in the hospital and could use some support, or if you just want to learn about listening skills to be a better friend, this workshop can help you strengthen your relationship skills. If you want to sign up, please email me at minister at hvuuc.org. Don't tell me after the service, I will forget. <laughs> um, also, uh, there was going to be a social justice committee meeting after church today, but they have decided to hold that until tomorrow night so that we can all participate in the kitchen celebration. I must admit to you all that I had a different benediction planned for us today, um, but I'm not doing what's listed in the bulletin. As we've gone on this journey to explore our stories, our similarities, and our differences in perspective, and to honor how much each of us brings to the beloved community here, I think I really only have one thing to say. Love is coming. It's on its way. Look. Our closing hymn is One More Step, number 168 in the gray hymnal. We hope you've discovered the strengths of your own story today, the wonder of the stories of others, and perhaps a safe landing place for all that makes you who you are in this community. Pledges and donations are the bricks and mortar that we use to build this community. So as we sing, we're going to pass the offering plate. We hope that you can throw a little something in there to express your support. Please rise with us in body or spirit for our closing hymn, number 168, One More Step. <laughs> 